Many people on the left have claimed that racism is bad, but why? None of them seem to have the answer. Only I am brave enough to explain why racism is bad. Actually, it's because it's wrong. <laughs> it's, it's bad because it's wrong. It's bad for a couple of reasons. Okay, let's go back to the beginning of the, the first big bad, okay? The greatest mistake, right here. Some idiot, like a billion years ago, walked on land to lay eggs or something. And uh, now the rest of us have to pay taxes. So this is like the big starting mistake, okay? Everything from here was downhill, uh, sometimes literally, because there aren't really any hills if you swim around in the ocean. So the concept of downhill was not even really a thing back then. Yeah. So here's the thing, okay? Uh, after this happened, this mistake, time passed, and, uh, you know, animals got more complicated. And some of the higher animals, some of the more evolved animals, usually ones that have a social instinct, developed something that is a general trend you see in social animals, but in humans we call it tribalism. Tribalism is an intrinsic, evolutionarily determined uh, predisposition we have towards favoring some groups over others, the tribes. We call it tribalism because tribe has a really broad, like cultural and etymological uh, root, meaning that it can apply to like a lot of different groups, you know? Like people can be tribal over uh, the sports teams they like. In fact, sports teams are one of the purest examples of tribalism because what sports team you like really doesn't mean like anything except usually where you grew up because people have biases towards their hometown teams. But some sports fans are insane, you know? There's a culture of something called hooliganism in England where uh, football fans, that's soccer to us Americans, will literally, like, do riots over the results of their games, which is very wacky, very wacky stuff, right, you know? It doesn't make much evolutionary sense, you know? Like, well, why would animals competing for resources dedicate so much energy and potentially, you know, risk themselves uh, in the process of fighting over something which, like, objectively doesn't matter? And the truth of it is that Tribalism, conceptually, is like a vestigial product of certain evolutionary psychological forces that are maybe helpful on their own, right? So if you take a look at tribalism in its historical context, like um, literally my tribe versus their tribe, because human tribes literally did fight with each other for a very long time, uh, having a kind of like instinctual bias towards the things you find familiar makes a lot of sense. Bias towards familiarity isn't even a, um, like a, a fault in reasoning, you know? It's actually a reasonable thing. You should be biased towards what you know, shouldn't you? Uh, you know it, after all. Very helpful uh, in, that, in that sense. Fascinating. Cats also demonstrate tribal preferences. Just pattern recognition, right? Most of the things that make us really cool in our heads it comes down to pattern recognition. Um, the ability for us to learn, form patterns in our brain based on what we learn, and then develop new habits to respond to the patterns we've identified. Really cool thing that we can do, actually. Very, very, very helpful. Kind of simplifying hooligans. Yes, the hooligan cultural stance and chatter angry, but you do fight over your football games. Don't get mad at me for saying that. It's true. Just because there's more to it doesn't mean it's not true when I say that. I'm sure you can understand plenty of reasons why people might have cognitive biases that pull them towards things they understand. You know, pattern recognition is right. A whole bunch of the way our brain functions is finding ways to quickly make snap judgments with the smallest amount of information possible. After all, if you never make any assumptions, you're not going to live very long in the wild, right? Oh, what's that bush rustling over there? Who knows? It's just a noise. What's this berry that looks exactly like the last berry I ate right before I got sick? Who knows? It could just look the same. Obviously, the ability to form patterns is really, really, really important for survival. Tribalism is just another kind of pattern-seeking, pattern-forming behavior. It's just a bias towards what you know. Can I help you? Over here, an example of a creature so simple that it actually can't form patterns in its head. For example, 
She has not yet seemed to notice that when the back room lights are on, and the bisexual lighting is in effect, that I don't have time to play. A human would have understood this. But somehow, after years of living with her, she does not. Cognitive biases uh, that lead us towards pattern recognition have been evolutionarily helpful. They're still helpful to this day. The ability to make snap judgments based on basic assumptions is a critical part of basically everyone's thought processes. We do it all the time. How do you, like, identify red flags in a potential relationship? How do you recognize whether or not an area of town is a little bit more sketch and maybe you shouldn't walk down alleyways? Like, stuff like that, right? You know, how do you, like, well, what do you look for? You form patterns. Humans are good at it. Of course, the ability to form patterns and recognize those patterns doesn't always mean the patterns that you identify are correct, right? Like, just because your brain is wired to, uh, you know, um, identify things that you've seen and try to pull info from it, like assume stuff from it, that doesn't necessarily mean that the patterns you're looking for are uh, accurate. Here's an example. Um, astrology and horoscopes. People who believe in the power of astrology and horoscopes, like, oh, you're a Capricorn, you're a Cancer, you're a so on and so forth, because they're tuned in to this method of finding patterns, they will find those patterns. You see this all over the place. People who believe in horoscopes tend to find that humans fall into reliable patterns based on the months in which they were born, right? People who believe in ghosts notice a relationship between historical bad happenings in a neighborhood and like spooky noises at night. In reality, none of these things have been scientifically demonstrated, but people will swear by it. Now we look at that and laugh. We think, oh, ha ha ha. Can't you realize that social conditioning and personal experience are biasing your pattern, uh, your pattern seeking brain to the point where you're making like really stupid assertions? Can't you see it? Can't you, can't you see that you're doing that? We humans broadly, would never do that. We would never allow cultural bias to inform the snap judgments we make about people based on superficial attributes. That would be silly. We are immune to those biases. No chance whatsoever of this happening to most people. The truth is, this bias towards pattern recognition is a universal fault in human reasoning. It is a fundamental problem with the way we form thoughts in the sense that it can produce negative outcomes. It can produce positive outcomes, but it also can produce negative outcomes. Much like any other process of reasoning, you need uh, an introspective mind. You need to be self-aware and self-critical to find what your brain is doing and try to correct for it. You know what I mean? Like, you may not be able to make your brain be a perfect arbiter of reason, but you can reflect and correct for the stuff that your brain is doing to try to understand when and why it might have been led astray. That's one of the reasons I really like sociological training, because it really teaches you to be willing to go like a couple levels deeper when it comes to um, stuff that might otherwise seem really obvious. So it's good to be critical about that stuff. Race is something people do when they run really fast, but it's also something that is heavily determined by geography. Uh, after all, you know, if, if you were to ask anyone, where on earth could I find black people? You know, they would circle somewhere here and you, where could I find white people? You know, you'd get here and where can I find Asian people? And just, uh, well, that can get really complicated, I think more so, but you know, you get a whole lot, you know, a whole lot over there. Um, yeah. Where can I find Italians? And then of course you need two circles right here and right here. And, uh, there you have it. The Italians. There's, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot out there, you know? So what is, uh, what is race? So the problem with talking about race is that there is a biological definition of race and there is a sociological definition of race. Right now, today, the definition we use for race is relatively modern. In fact, it's not just modern in the colloquial sense, it's modernist in the sense that it's part of a broader project humans have engaged in to understand and categorize the world. Our current conceptualization of race is part of a scheme to dominate natural differences with a uh, sort of uh, paternalistic scientific analysis. Uh, or to put it another way, you have the complexities of nature squeezed into very narrow-minded scientific taxonomy 
usually in order to make a point. But think about the history of what we might call, um, if not race in the modern sense, tribe. Because race in the modern sense has not always been important. Most historical empires have been multicultural and multiracial. I mean, that's what it means to be an empire, right? Um, whether you're talking the Persians or the Romans or the Mongolians, these empires have stretched across vast swaths of land and have encompassed many different ethnic groups. Sometimes the ethnic groups they encompass include different groups of what we would call different races today. So you will have, for example, Moors um, in, uh, in the Roman Empire. You'll have a great many people in the, um, in the, uh, the, the, the Persian Empire or the Assyrian Empire or the Mongol Empire. It goes on and on. Uh, I'm not a historian, but this is a well understood and recognized fact. And if you look at texts from these histories, you'll find that the way they cared about and categorized people was not the way that we do today, right? Like, you can go back and read, like, um, millennia-old texts on how different people categorized each other. The classic example is the one of the Romans, who did not have an understanding of race the way we do, but cared more about the distinction between the Roman citizen and the barbarian. The barbarians that the Romans so often complained about were often white and Germanic, or Nordic, whiter than the Mediterranean, it, you know, Romans <laughs> by far. Where, but Rome today is, you know, held up sort of as a, um, a, a testament to sort of historical Western civilization. The, uh, this is only partially true. We're talking about ancient empires that stretch very long periods of time. There are always infinite complexities here. The basic truths here, the fundamental reasoning I'm engaging in, is stone cold true. In terms of like how people thought of each other, you know, there's that famous writing. I actually forget who wrote it. I think it was from a Greek uh, traveler and philosopher who said that the um, Arabs were thin-blooded, which made them quick-witted and intelligent because of the warmth down there, whereas the Nordic peoples were uh, thick-blooded because of the cold, and it made them stupid. Uh, which is an interesting and extremely unscientific way of thinking about how humans might differ from each other, but, you know, people like to make assumptions. We like to do that. Humans like to explain the world around us by looking for patterns and finding explanations. We are biologically driven to do this. Uh, Aristotle, gotcha. We are biologically driven to do this. Um, it is a it is a, 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 a boulder rolling down the hill. You know, the momentum, we can, we can direct the boulder, uh, but it will continue to roll downhill. Uh, we must be careful of these things. If you take a look, I mean, historical medicine, right? The four humors, right? What is it? Um, Bilic, or Bilic, um, sanguine, melancholic. Um, uh, uh, what's the fourth one? Um, Flemic. Is that Flemic? Yeah, Flemic, melancholic, sanguine, and um, now I forget the second one that I mentioned before. People find patterns. People find patterns. It's what we're driven to do. I'm going to, I'm going to, choleric, thank you. I'm going to roll us up like a little bit more towards where we are now, like um, historically, okay? So um, basically, you know, as I said, a, a million billion years ago, a fish rolled on land and now we have to pay taxes. Well, uh, you know, about 450 years ago, the world order looked, uh, you know, while not exactly the way that it does today, the basic power structure that we um, we understand today has 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 taken a sort of um, uh, a concrete shape. That is to say, the modern patterns of uh, European colonialism. And you know, if you want to look on a map, like where the where in the world Europe colonized, you know, you get the whole map, right? Like it was a big thing. And uh, you know, we we were having colonies developed over here, and you know, we need slaves for the colonies because the purpose of colonies under mercantilism is to enrich the empire that they're a part of, which is why they cared so much about their colonies and. You know, it's much, much, much more cost effective to use slaves to uh, work these plantations rather than to use just indentured servants because well, a lot of economic reasons, you know, obviously if you own a slave, you own the children of the slave. Uh, also, slaves had no legal rights, which made them more attractive to prospective buyers because they didn't have to uh, worry about mistreating them, leading to legal problems down the road after the indentured servant became free, so on and so on. It's a whole process. We're moving Africans over. It's a whole dealio. We also live in an era of scientific enlightenment. 
don't we? Along with the Enlightenment comes an interest in empiricism, an interest in understanding the world through scientific processes. And, you know, I'm going to hit you with a hot take here. People today and people back then were able to notice empirical differences between the white Europeans and the black Africans. Namely, to start, the Europeans were more pale skinned. That's a big one, you know. Uh, they didn't speak the same language generally. Um, different levels of broad civilizational development between most European colonial nations and African nations, which, you know, can be charted up to a bunch of really complicated anthropological stuff. There were differences. And here's the thing. When you are identifying differences between groups, pattern recognition is one thing. The question is, what do you do with the patterns you find, right? So personal bias can explain a lot on how people arrive at the patterns they seek and what information they derive from it. Let's take, for example, economic class, okay? In the United States today, two children are born. One is born to a very poor single mother, and the other one is born to a billionaire family. Who then is more likely to become, at the end of their life, wealthy? Well, there is a statistical answer to this. If you're born wealthy, you're more likely to stay wealthy, and if you're born poor, you're more likely to stay poor. So if you sort of take this information in aggregate, and you look at humans on average, a person might make the reason, you know, assessment that poor families are likely to die poor, and rich families are likely to die rich. But what you do with that information says a lot about you. It's a frequent libertarian belief that we live in a meritocracy and that everyone is equally capable of becoming rich or poor, depending entirely on their actions. This is a delusional belief that is unsupported by all evidence we have on the subject, but it is a belief they hold anyway. But if you do believe that we live in a pure meritocracy where only your behavior will determine your wealth, and it's a fair shot elsewise, you might reason that poor families remain poor because of an inherent, hereditary, intellectual inferiority in the poor family. This is not at all an uncommon position. In fact, variations of this ideology have been expressed by eugenicists all throughout, well, the late 19th century to today, actually. Um, the idea that the poor are poor, not because of socioeconomic factors, but because of inherent, inherently being lesser. Now, again, this is a really silly conclusion to derive from the information available, but it's one they derived anyway, isn't it? Isn't it? They did that anyway. They did look at poor families staying poor, with nothing to, 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 to do but scrabble for dirt and coins tossed at them in the sand and look at rich families being born in manners and thought, I wonder why the wealthy family stays wealthy. They must be genetically better. They did that. And much in the same way that the political biases of those eugenicists played a role in the way they interpreted the data they had available, I go back to the slave trade. Leaving aside the uh, relative disparity in civilizational development uh, at the time. And it's important to remember, by the way, uh, that for periods in history, uh, during, say, the Golden Age of Islam, or critical points in Chinese and Indian history, these civilizations have been more materially developed than Europe was broadly at that time. You know, we're not at the end of history. We're all currently moving through history. And while it may be the case that in the colonial period, Europe was undeniably the broader power in the world. Uh, if you were to cut the, you know, cut the line off at like 1700 AD, you know, I don't think people would agree with that. And then you'd have all of those, I don't know, you know, golden age of Islam or India or China supremacists talking about the natural uh, superiority of their civilizational development. We now have two groups of people, broadly. We have white colonists and black slaves. They're moving on over to the new world where they can make a lot of money for their colonial powers, okay? The pattern-seeking brain is in full effect. Now, it doesn't take a genius, the average person, to recognize there's kind of a difference between your average 
European colonist and African slave, you know, kind of in two different categories socially, a broad set of differences, uh, visual, obviously, cultural, linguistic, uh, God, pretty much everything that they, you know, pointed out, uh, pointed to some kind of fundamental difference. Now, obviously, uh, if you really think about it, leaving aside the skin color thing, most of the stuff that made Africans different from Europeans wouldn't have been present if you took a European and raised them in Africa, right? Like, if you took a European baby and they were raised in an African kingdom at that time, they would be speaking the language, they would have adopted the culture of the people around them, obviously. The only thing that would have remained distinct between the two would have been, well, their literal biological race, like their skin tone and stuff. But people like to pattern seek. So, it was believed that there were causative differences, or sorry, causative factors between the race of Europeans and Africans and the differences between them. And we live in this time in a period of scientific enlightenment. It's not enough to just, like a Philistine, have categories to differentiate people. You need scientific categories, which is where we invent scientific racism or the taxonomy of races, if you prefer. Rather than simply differentiating people based on kind of arbitrary cultural, civic, or geographic categories, um, instead, we make an effort to draw this distinction from a fundamental scientific truth. Do you understand the difference? This wasn't like the Roman abstract citizen versus barbarian line, you know? This wasn't like a kind of collection of cultural forces that they sort of um, distilled down into a set of categories. This was a, according to the scientific uh, racists, it, this was a, a fully empirical description of the evolutionary taxonomy of the human race. Obviously, the Europeans thought themselves more evolved than the Africans. If you want, you can Google and find a ton of really racist scientific drawings, you know, of, of like um, how humans develop. And then you'll have like the gorilla and then black people and then like white people, you know, like, yeah, of course, you know. We all know how scientific racism plays out, uh, both contemporarily and historically. Now, here's the problem, okay? Uh, I said earlier that race has a biological and sociological definition. I put forward two things. The biological definition of race is useless, and the sociological definition of race is given completely unjustified import. And separating these two things and understanding why, you know, is really, really important. Obviously, all this could fit into a book and leave plenty of room for a sequel, so I can't cover everything, but I want to talk first very briefly about the biological differentiation of the races, okay? Way back 300,000 years ago or so, basically all humans were in the cradle of civilization or Africa or, you know, we were just talking about the Euphrates. Uh, they moved around a lot, you know. Um, when I say humanity, I am, of course, talking about Homo sapiens sapiens. Uh, the Neanderthals and other pseudo-human tribes uh, had since been wiped out or were in the process of being wiped out. Um, by our, I don't know, superior rock-throwing skills. I, I don't know. Humans made their way all over the world. Uh, we, uh, we, we did really cool stuff like walking long distances. You know? It was great. Sometimes land bridges formed, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I'm simplifying, like, you know, research that people have spent their entire lives on. <laughs> you know, people, people got all over the place. We, we really moved places. And the environmental conditions that made people over here look a certain way didn't apply everywhere else. So, for example, over here in Africa, it tends to be really hot. That's due to a couple reasons. First of all, uh, it's on the equator, which is where the sun, on average, strikes the earth the most. Got a lot of desert, too. Deserts tend to be pretty hot, cold during the night, but a lot of sun here, you know. It's a toasty area. The Middle East, very toasty. You know, you, you get that. You're following me. And uh, as a product of that, Neanderthals died out 40,000 years ago, just FYI. Damn, they lasted a while. To not die in this uh, sweltering heat uh, and the barrage of radiation cast out by our sun, we needed to have darker skin. Melanin, 
is a substance produced by our bodies as a defense mechanism against excessive UV radiation. Uh, we have such a robust defense response to the, uh, uh, the UV radiation that humans are capable of tanning by spending more time in the sun. It's not just a genetic process. It's actually possible for humans to, on their own, you know, uh, well, maybe not all humans. Yeah, I'm Polish Irish. I've never seen myself tan that much. Uh, you know, um, every bit of info given in chat that's irrelevant to my lecture here, I'm me mentally making a note to ban all of you. Please, I have ADHD. When you give me a tiny bit of info on Neanderthals that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about at all, but I look at it, it's like, oh, that's neat. You pull me from what I'm talking about. Have mercy, please, okay? I know you know more than me on a bunch of individual subjects combined. It's okay. Uh, you know, uh, let, let me, let, let the train run, okay? Here, I'm trying my best. So basically, uh, the sky is toasty, and uh, humans have anti-toast biological mechanisms Oh, wait, hold on. I'm getting this guy. I'm getting this guy for sure. IP ban one uh, Jin Suresh. Wait, here we go. Right after I said it. That one I had to go for. More importantly, the sky is hot and scary and lasers are being shot at us constantly. And we need to survive. But whoa, what happens when you move all the way up here? The sky is a little bit less frightening over here, you know. Don't get me wrong, you can get uh, skin cancer anywhere. Uh, but um, it is not as evolutionarily necessary for people over here to have super dark skin. After all, there are biological disadvantages to having dark skin in areas where you don't get too much sun. Uh, having higher levels of melanin production reduces the efficiency with which you absorb vitamin D. Vitamin D is a chemical that you need to not want to kill yourself. This is why, to this day, uh, the Swedes, the Finnish, uh, you know, the Dutch, uh, every, everyone's people up here want to kill themselves, like mm, a third of the year or so. Um, yeah, uh, it's 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 not great, but you know that's what laser beams are for. They're for keeping you from killing yourself. All right, you move all over the place, and different environmental factors explain why humans look different from each other. I'll try to explain a few, though a lot of this is still ongoing research, okay? I have read uh, uh, people saying that many of the attributes which we uh, consider to be a part of racial taxonomy are direct products of environmental stimuli. Skin color is an obvious one because it's a direct product of sun exposure. Uh, black people, on average, have flatter and wider noses than white people. I have heard this being explained as a very minor but nonetheless useful way of managing both heat and moisture retention in areas that have more sun exposure. I have heard this being more about preventing uh, sand from getting up your nose. I don't know what exactly the like proportion of these things are, and I don't know if anyone does. It's really complicated, and as it turns out, uh, really difficult to form experimental studies on because we're kind of sort of post hoc justifying uh, our evolutionary process. There's a lot of stuff that um, we attribute to uh, racial differences that is just like kind of a product of circumstance in a region. A good example would be um, uh, sickle cell anemia uh, in uh, 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 West Africans. West Africans, you know, have to deal with mosquitoes a lot kind of cringe, not great. Um, so naturally, the uh, ways in which they, you know, develop regionally uh, has to have a biological defense mechanism against malaria, which kills approximately one billion humans every minute. Um, funnily enough, you know, given that a lot of West Africans were stolen from their home and brought over on slave ships to the United States, we actually have a pretty direct look at the development of sickle cell anemia in a population once they're removed from the environment that necessitated its development. Sickle cell anemia is not that much of a thing in American descendants of West Africans. Part of this is, of course, because many black slaves were raped by white people when they came over, and that did lead to a kind of genetic dissipation. Um, and part of that is because without the environmental pressure to develop in that fashion, there's no longer a need to develop sickle cell anemia. 
It makes racial differences feel a bit trivial, doesn't it? At least in my mind it does. Sometimes people talk about racial differences like there's some kind of inherent, like, fundamental, um, like, overriding, like, categorization to race. Like this very, 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 like, distinct thing. Um, but of course that's not true, you know. We, and we, we know that's not true. Um, lactose intolerance for East Asians as well. Um, uh, it's not just East Asians, by the way. Uh, the people who like milk the most, I believe, are Europeans. And I think that's just because we chug milk a ton. <laughs> really, historically, like, the, the, the areas, like, where, um, where, where you, where, 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 where people have more or less lactose intolerance, I really think it's just a bunch of, like, Nordic milk chuggers. Yeah, like the winters or whatever. It's just, it's literally just a bunch of uh, Horgen, Bjorgen, Bjorgen people up here who like have their gallon milk barrels that they would chug through during the winter. And now congratulations, the entire subcontinent gets to enjoy like cheese wheels without shitting themselves. It's something like that. It, it really is a little bit like that. That's really not that much of a joke. Differences in like genetic propensity for lactose tolerance and intolerance um, varies based on what is like largely not even just an environmental, but a circumstantial difference. The reason for that is because lactose intolerance is caused by the ability for your body to break down lactose, and that's caused by your gut bacteria. Your gut bacteria, the kinds that you develop, are shaped in part by the way your body has designed itself to attract and cultivate some kinds of gut bacteria, right? This is one of the reasons why it's healthy for young humans to uh, drink breast milk, because breast milk is basically like a G fuel power cell creatine protein shake powder weight gain for babies' digestive systems. Uh, you know, it 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 just gives them the rundown. But is that a racial difference? Like, oh, white people are better with cheese? I guess it coincides with race because of like environmental overlap in some cases, but. The, you know, that's that seems a bit shaky to me, you know what I mean? That's, that seems like if you went into a room full of white people and bonked everyone on the head, and then you went into a room full of black people and didn't bonk them on the head, you'd say, like, the white race has a predisposition towards head bonks or something. I don't know. That doesn't seem very um, inherent to me. Vosh, there are genetic differences? Well, yeah. The genetic differences would determine the lining of your gut which allows for the cultivation of the bacteria that breaks down lactose. Are you paying attention? There are people in chat trying to second guess me. Genetic differences can be formed. That's what I'm saying. These genetic differences are a product of relatively short-term, circumstantial, environmentally and circumstantially determined factors. Not some inherent, like, category difference. Is this different from evolution? No! Evolution can act on very long and short time scales. Populations can adjust relatively quickly. You can see average differences in the heights of North and South Koreans uh, based only on the food they have available. But given enough time, that will cement itself in a more fundamental genetic sense. Keep in mind, natural selection literally happens. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 like generation by generation. You realize that, right? If you have a population of a thousand blue people and a thousand green people, and then in one big ethnic cleansing, you kill all the green people, the subsequent populations that derive from that now entirely blue population, that is going, that is an evolutionary change. It's a bottlenecking process. Um, you understand? Have you never heard of a bottleneck? A bottleneck can happen in a single generation. A bottleneck can happen in a minute. You understand what a bottleneck is, right? Evolutionary bottleneck. The reason I'm bringing all of this up is because I think it's very important for people to understand that genetic differences in a population can be caused by incredibly trivial, circumstantial, and short-term differences, okay? When we talk about the differences between racial groups, keep in mind, it's not like all black people have the same gene code. Obviously, there's huge variance and we sort of take the aggregate. The aggregate can be affected by a ton of conditions. What's well, a bottleneck? It's, I'm looking at an image of it right now. For real, are people in the US not taught this in schools? Look at my chat, do you think they are? 
I don't mean to condescend. I just want it to be very, very clear, okay? Hereditary don't mean genetic, and genetic does not mean, like, inherent fundamental differences, you know? Uh, it, just, uh, it just doesn't. Uh, here, I'll put it one more way, okay? I'll put it one more way. Let's say that Europeans and Africans both have a 50% chance of a single type of gene expression. We'll call it the cringe gene. A lot of people are cringe, right? Let's say Europeans, Africans, 50% chance that they are cringe. You following with me? Now, let's say that the African death squads roll through Europe from one border to the next, culling people who have an expression of the cringe gene, leaving only people with an unexpressed gene. The next generation of Europeans, if we're following through in this incredibly simplistic example, will have no genetic expression of the cringe gene. Do you understand? This is a literal evolutionary change in the population. It's not an evolutionary change in the sense that a single genome code has altered in one generation, though that happens a little bit each generation, of course. Rather, we're talking about population genetics. Do you understand? Population genetics take averages from selections of larger traits, and as long as there are selective forces within those traits, you can very quickly cause changes uh, within a population over very trivial stuff. And kablamo, you've got racial differences. No, not none because they still carry the gene. You can... Much in the same way that individual members of a population can carry a, 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 a disease but be immune to it, like they're a carrier, it's possible to have in your gene code a, a, a gene or an expression, but pass on a propensity to not express that gene. I'm going over a lot of subjects here, guys. Please be charitable here. Work with me, okay? Moving on. Everything that I'm talking about right now is one of the main reasons why biologists and anthropologists really do not use race as a biological marker for human differences right now. They don't. They just do not. Um, the reason for this, I mean, biological race just doesn't, like, tell you anything. Biological, like, if you try to determine a person's race based on their, their DNA sequencing, you're not going to have a great time. In reality, humans aren't broken up into a collection of like distinct racial taxonomies. Uh, they're actually broken up into uh, individual and population-based expressions of literally thousands of different traits, you know? And the closer you get to any given geographic point, the more those traits are going to resemble the archetype of what we imagine that racial category to be. Or to put it another way, and this is something that you can literally see in maps, if we imagine that the geographic center point of black racial associated genetics is right here and European right here, you can literally look at gene markers in between these two points and find a gradient of human beings um, getting closer from one and closer to another. Oh, it's ban all of them. Ban them all. Um, it is literally like a gradient. And if it's a gradient, um, then you can't really make an argument for distinct racial taxonomy, can you? Um, it's, uh, it, it doesn't really make much sense. It doesn't tell you very much. Race has been used historically far more as a sociological categorization than a racial one. Or to put it another way, I want you to think real hard. Can you think of any, and I mean any, lasting viable research on the scientific differences between the races that is held up to the test of time? Not really. That's because for the past few decades, biologists have moved towards clines. We're getting way out of my field here. Clines. All right. You guys can't behave hard enough to pay attention. A cline is a biological term right here. Uh, which refers to the, uh, uh, here, a measurable gradient in a single character or biological trait of a species across its geographic range. First conceptualized in 1938, see, by Julian Huxley.
The character of the Klein is uh, referred to as usually genetic or phenotypic. Uh, this is the metric by which biologists measure stuff that used to be considered race before. I'm trying to think of a good way to visually demonstrate this. The best way that I can think of, imagine a, I've got it. Imagine a gradient. Give me the gradient tool. Imagine a gradient just like this. Mm, let's get a little more broad. There we go. Uh, no, mm, even broader. Yes. No, even more green slanted because red is more dominant in the, there we go. Nope, that's too far. And nope. Nope. Good enough. Imagine this. Uh, will you, I ask, find me a line at the exact point where uh, one color becomes red or green from the center? Whoa, well, that time it's a little bit easier. Uh, you can't, of course. It's not possible. You know, is this green or red? Is this green or red? It's color. Now, imagine if I add another layer. Humans aren't just one gene expression, are they? That's ridiculous. Humans are actually uh, thousands of gene expressions that vary over a population. So if I reduce the opacity of this to 50%, Vosh, doesn't this example kind of work against you? We do use words for colors quite a bit. Ah, but reactor 1001, think for a second. The terms we use for color, are those socially ascribed? or biological or physiological realities? Are they categorizations projected from our biased perceptions? Or are they empirical things? All cultures have different lines for what they describe to be blue, green, etc. Ah, what an interesting and beautiful set of colors that has produced. Now if I create another one, and I reduce the opacity even further, and I go over here, there we go. So I ask you, can you find where one race becomes the other? This might seem like a silly question, but again, human genetic variance trends across thousands of different uh, genes. I've only added three layers to this. You really think you can categorize race in a biological sense and have it mean anything? The truth is, if you want to form arbitrary categories, you can. It's not impossible to do so. The question is, are those arbitrary categories scientifically useful? Time and time again, science has shown that race is not because it was an intuitive, pattern-recognized system that we developed through nothing more than very basic phenotypical differences between um, ourselves and uh, uh, you, uh, you know Africans. I'm going to point this out in one other way that might seem a little bit strange, but I want you to think. I want you to open up your mind chakra for a second, okay? Um, can you do that for me, please? I want you to, I want you to work with me. Can you, uh, just out of curiosity, describe to me the race of this woman? Uh, but I've all primed you for an answer, haven't I? How do you think most people would answer? You know, take away the sociological education. Given the fact that people are arguing over black elves, I think most people would be comfortable referring to her as uh, a, a white elf, which is kind of strange because in the uh, Lord of the Rings, you know, um, yeah, here we go. Same with dwarves, right? The lady in the center, this is from Lord of the Rings, is a dwarf and she's black, or at least the actress playing her is black. But of course, Dwarves and elves are literally not human. But does it not seem strange to you that in our world, in the real world, people who are white supremacists are more likely to identify with a white than with a black human, even though canonically in the lore of that universe, elves don't have a race. They're derivatives of nature. What is it about racial categorization that allows us to do that? And can it really be a biological descriptor when people are capable of seeing race in uh, creatures that literally don't have it in the human sense? You can see this all over the place, by the way. For a long time, uh, white supremacists have reaffirmed the perceived superiority of white people 
by clinging on to cultural signifiers of non-humans who have pale skin. If race was truly a scientific biological category, how would it make any sense at all for the transcendent cultural weight of light skin to apply to creatures that are literally not the same species as us in fantasy or in science fiction? Do you understand what I'm getting at? Nobody uses race as a biological demarker. Scientists don't, and racists don't either. It's a fundamental uh, uh, taxonomy that transcends biology. It's more akin to spiritual for them. Uh, if you want a historical example of this, you can take a look at the Nazis. Did the Nazis like IQ tests? I'm asking you a question. No, they didn't. Because a particular ethnic group kept outperforming the Aryan Germans. Eventually, IQ tests were dismissed, uh, dismissed as a, a, a Jewish falsity uh, because uh, um, they were outperforming the Germans, the Nazis. Oh, I thought they liked it against POC. They did. They liked the IQ tests when they did better than the people who they thought they were better than, and they disliked IQ tests when the IQ test showed that they weren't as good as other people they didn't like. Is this really a scientific assessment of the races? Why did so many eugenicists have to lie about the data they collected while uh, doing research in Africa? Uh, why have so many findings of theirs been discredited historically, not just because they were racist and inaccurate, but because of outhood, like outright fraud on the people who construct these studies? If this was purely scientific, why is nobody treating it like a science and everyone tre treating it like a social category? Right? Nobody treats this like a science. Scientific racists are not educated on modern biological clinal studies. The case for race being a biological reality has been determined. It is. It is a biological reality that different humans have different basic phenotypical expressions, that different groups of humans, on average, have different skin tones and a couple of different bits, their hair, their facial shape, you know, whatever. That has been cemented. The usefulness of race as a scientific descriptor outside of that has not been determined, and every bit of evidence we have determines the opposite. It has consistently been found in every possible faculty, social and scientific, that not only is race not scientifically valid, but no one even really thinks it is. They just pretend it is, because the cloak of scientific legitimacy has been the mechanism through which European white supremacists have legitimized their domination over black people. It has always been a convenient excuse, a half-hearted justification. But do you think then that the white colonial powers would have freed their slaves if suddenly they could have been presented with biological evidence that the black slaves had a higher capacity for intelligence than the white Europeans? If somebody could provide them irrefutable evidence of that fact, would they have suddenly changed their mind? Of course not. They would have said the studies were false. Modern racists do when more and more research indicates that the racial IQ gap is not uh, a product of uh, hereditary genetics. Much of it is, of course, a product of, um, uh, uh, you know, passed down or hereditary differences, but one must remember that family wealth is also hereditary. Many things are hereditary without them necessarily being genetic in nature. Complicated terms, often misused by people with an agenda. I understand this comes across a little bit preachy, but there's a reason why I'm rambling on like this. And the reason for that is because I want to make it exceedingly clear that the history of race as a scientific concept has been a history of failure of dead ends, scientifically, sociologically. Every major bit of research, every study, every line we've tried to take, uh, things like phrenology, uh, you know, skull shape science measurement, trying to use people's facial shapes to determine their likelihood of criminal behavior, 
wrong, 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 wrong. Whereas modern biological clinal studies are consistent and accurate and scientifically useful. And it really is that simple. But I've only explained why race as a biological construct is wrong. I have not yet explained why racism is morally wrong. Uh, see, because as I have just pointed out, the white supremacist most often does not actually care whether or not scientific data verifies their beliefs. Uh, the real question for them, you know, uh, you know, the racist question, the RQ, is uh, knowing that they have a biased, intuitive, tribal allegiances informing their decision-making here and not any kind of scientific inquiry. How do you change their minds? How do you prove that they're wrong? Well, of course, I'm a, um, a moral anti-realist, so I don't believe you can really prove anything to be wrong. You need axiomatic values to attempt to maximize through descriptive claims, uh, or prescriptive claims, sorry, through normative ethics. Um, and in my case, you know, I'm going to appeal to a, uh, a, you know, an axiom I think most people have, okay? Uh, and it is that humans should be happy. They should be well. H sh humans should experience well-being. Not everyone believes that. I do. If you're looking to maximize that value, then all the arguments that I'm about to make necessarily follow. Okay. All right. First of all, a common argument made against, whew, against racial inclusivity is the argument against multiculturalism. This is an argument that's very easy to demolish if you think about it for any length of time ever. We often uh, act out of sort of um, uh, myopic historicism when we complain about multiculturalism, which, by the way, multiculturalism is and always has been a dog whistle for multi-ethnic and multiracial societies, which is why YouTube channels so concerned with multiculturalism will post videos of black Americans in America looting 7-Elevens, despite the fact that those black Americans have literally, down to their family roots, been here longer than the white cops who will show up and ruin their fun. Uh, so, you know, again, multiculturalism, we mean ethnic or at least racial hegemony. That's what they mean. The problem <clears throat> with the belief that multiculturalism is bad uh, is, is multivariate, but I'm going to simplify it because otherwise I'm going to be rambling for a long time. First of all, America, a multicultural society. Oh my God, that is the gradient tool. America, a multicultural society, is also, uh, you know, pardon me for sounding a little bit chauvinistic here, the most powerful and wealthy nation to have ever existed in the history of humanity by far. We are so far ahead of the rest of the world, and we have successfully dominated it militarily and economically. And despite the fact that the world is currently going to hell in a handbasket, we actually enjoy a relatively significant degree of internal stability. The greatest sources of internal instability in recent history have come from the Donald Trump 2020 election fraud conspiracy theory and the political division that it has produced. Donald Trump, as far as I am aware, is white. Uh, his followers are majority white. In this case, the, uh, the line drawn down the union is a uh, racial line, and it is one white people are, uh, uh, you know, sort of driving into the, uh, into the dirt. In terms of social stability, the idea that the American Republic is uh, growing unstable as a product of, like, uh, black people shooting each other uh, is delusional and simply not the case. You know, a lot of uh, racists want to pretend that, like, a marginal rate of, uh, of, of um, local crime is somehow going to take down like a global empire. Like, oh yeah, dude, Atlanta had like three murders by black people. That's not Atlanta, that's Maria. Yeah. The, the other weekend, like the empire's done. Uh, shut the f*** up. You have no idea what you're talking about. Just admit you're scared of black people. The grand threats to civilizations are economic and geopolitical. Uh, they are ones of political stability. They are ones of a civic society. They are not ones of individual acts of crime. Uh, it is simply not the case. That's one. 
Uh, second of all, you could apply this exact same standard to places all over the world. China, multi-ethnic. Uh, most countries in Western Europe enjoy at least a healthy proportion of ethnic and racial diversity and are also on top of the world, right underneath us. Um, countries that have incredibly high rates of racial diversity, like, for example, Brazil, despite their many problems, uh, have demonstrated a surprisingly robust degree of social cohesion, which is interesting because by all rights, you would think that countries in Latin America have every political and moral right to descend into a kind of permanent race riot. Uh, if you know why these countries are the way they are, if you know why there's a white minority and lots of brown and black people, and the white people tend to have more money, and all they, they tend to live in areas that look suspiciously like they might have used to be plantations, you know? It is very... The fact that this place is not just a permanent racial killing field uh, is an indication that we're capable of getting along. Just want to make that clear. The Romans, the Mongolians, I don't know the exact boundaries of the Mongolian Empire, so I'm just going <laughs> to just going to get all of it, okay? Thank you. The Persians, the Ottomans, all empires are by necessity multi-ethnic and multiracial. They're empires, of course. How can you be an empire without being multi-ethnic or multiracial? You think there weren't socioeconomic problems in integrating disparate tribes with different cultures? Uh, different levels of development, different attitudes towards crime and social engagement. Of course there were. And they did it. And then they went on to maintain the empires. Did the empires fall apart? Yeah. Everything does. The problem is, if you're looking for like, uh, if you're looking to history for examples to back up your point on how multicultural societies do or don't work, you're always going to find something that supports your argument because people are capable of engaging in incredible degrees of historical revisionism to justify the biases they have now. There have been hundreds of prominent civilizations that have risen and fallen. What caused it? If you want to believe that homosexuals did it, you can find evidence for that if you go to the right websites that uh, don't do uh, any research and are also, you know, uh, controlled by people trying to sell you, like, uh, you know, weight gain shakes or whatever. Um, if you want to believe it's feminism, like the Assyrian Empire was brought down by women or something. If you're Stefan Molyneux, pre-getting nuked off YouTube, you can believe the Russian... Not the Russian, sorry. The Russian Empire got brought down for completely separate reasons. The Roman Empire was brought down due to feminism. Fuck, he probably believes the Russian Empire was also brought down due to Bolshevik feminism or something. Whatever. You can always find a justification. The historical arguments do not trend in your favor, and the more educated the historian, the less likely they are to make any argument like that. In fact, historians generally are not likely to make arguments like that. Published historians tend to not engage in wild speculation while they project their current values onto pre-modern societies, in large part because it's a really stupid thing to do. Things didn't work the same back then. Things were different, and there's bits of info we just don't have. And also, from what we do know, it seems like most of the time, uh, the most consistent, you know, causative factor in empires declining could actually be addressed through Marxist materialist analysis. Because you will find a pretty strong recurring pattern of class differences between the aristocracy, the peasantry, and the slaves, causing internal agitation that eventually leads to civil conflict, uh, you know, misallocation of political resources, and eventual collapse. That's a pretty recurring trend, actually. Thank you, Marx. Good idea, Marx. Historical materialism beating out other people's explanations for why empires rise and fall since 18-something, whatever. When, when did Marx re re come out? Oh, whatever. Fantastic, right. So anyway, uh, another common argument uh, the racists will make, uh, about, you know, um, why racism is good and based actually, uh, has to do with, uh, crime. And when they say crime, what they really mean is black people, of course. Illegal immigrants commit disproportionately lower amounts of crime. Uh, you know, um, obviously like Im legal immigrants to the U S commit way less crime, uh, until you reach their children than their grandchildren, at which point they average out towards the mean. Why is all the crime being caused by black people? Well, a lot of crime is being caused by black people. I've talked about 1350 before, or I guess they say 1352 now, and I feel like I've effectively debunked this. By the way, this is a, uh, how do you say 
debunked isn't the right word, you know. Do black people commit a disproportionate amount of crime, violent crime? Yes. Um, is it because black people are dumb and gay? No. That assertion has been debunked. There's a very simple sociological explanation for it. Uh, it's very simple. Okay, I'm just going to go right into it. Are you ready for it? 1350 Part 2 Electric Boogaloo. Okay, so over here in the United States, um, ignore Mexico, Canada, Cuba, so on, you know, in the United States. This map was updated. This would be blue right now. Sorry, for those in the future, Hurricane Ian's happening right now. Um, I'm currently destroying Miami. The United States, it's a country that exists, tragically, despite the best efforts of socialists worldwide. And um, the Great Lakes are really cool. You know, that's cool. Uh, what's not cool is slavery. Uh, slavery happened. There was actually like a lot of it. Millions and millions of people. By the way, you know, a lot of the folks we stole from Africa, we just dumped into the ocean. Uh, either to, you know, make headway, people got sick and died, killed each other. Um, you know, sometimes they'd be lost in storms. Uh, there were a couple instances back when uh, the British Empire banned slavery of them sending out patrol boats and you'd have, um, you'd have uh, slave ships uh, that would have, um, uh, they, they would just dump their cargo, that's black people, off into the ocean so that when the patrol boats got close enough, it'd be like, oh yeah, we just ha have no cargo in our ship. We have this, we have like these food provisions, you know? Um, that's our cargo. Hello. And then like, there's like 400 people drowning at the bottom of the ocean because they 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 were weighed down with manacles because they couldn't float. They floated, they'd give the game away, right? So they all had like the chain to each other with the with the, the iron ball. You kick off the iron ball and they all go sliding off the ship. Yeah. Not great. Some might call this unethical, you know, if one were inclined to. Uh, yeah, we, we gave them the cement shoes. Yeah, they got superpowers from it. That's why they're uh, mermaids now. So... Some of these slaves survived and made it to the States, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Um, they, uh, they were subjected to what, what might arguably considered some of the worst working conditions that have ever been experienced by people on this planet. Um, it's very difficult. You know, you can, I think you can find instances of like a Latin American uh, slave colonies sometimes would have like a, I say turnover rate euphemistically here. I mean, they died. Um, but, you know, it, it, it was pretty bad. It's not great. But you have a lot of slaves, like a lot, a lot, a lot of slaves. By the time the U.S. colonies roll around, some of these states have like two-fifths of their population just slaves, you know? Um, a good portion of people in the South in the antebellum period uh, owned a slave. I think it was one-third of Southern families had one slave or more. Uh, something like that. One-third thereabouts, I think. Something like that. It's in the ballpark, you know. Modern Confederate lost cause types will pretend that only like two or three people in the South owned slaves and they were all Jewish. Uh, but that's not true. Uh, it was it was a relatively common thing. There was sort of a difference in experience as well, because while many middle class white families had a slave, most slaves in the South were on plantations. You know what I mean? Like they were thinly distributed across the middle class white families, but heavily concentrated in plantations where they would, of course, be, uh, you know, subjected to, um, uh, I would say, uh, believe it or not, worse than Amazon or UPS tier labor conditions. Uh, they would be worked to death. They would be raped. Uh, they'd be beaten to death, you know, in, in, in mass numbers. Uh, they'd be tortured and humiliated. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, they would escape north towards the uh, free states. And then the Supreme Court said, actually, you get to yoink those slaves back over states rights states rights are less important than southern plantation owners getting their freed slaves back slaves had no legal rights you could do literally anything i want you to imagine the most depraved possible thing you could do to like i don't know like a 10 year old black child or something as a white slave owner and just understand that there was literally nothing illegal about it this is the moral legacy of white uh colonialism in the united states uh there's really just no limit to the inhumanity uh, studies have been done on the amount of not even talking about reparations for damages, just lost labor. How much wealth is lost in the unpaid labor given or, you know, taken from the slaves. Uh, and then if you take that, multiply it by the inflation percentage, you would bankrupt the planet. The amount of material wealth and sort of cultural suffering that has been uh, stripped from black people in the United States is incomparable uh, it, it, to, to virtually any other American project. Uh, and cannot be compensated for in any reasonable fashion. It is uh, it is so great a crime that it, it it sort of transcends the capacity for humans 
to um to 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 even, to even like bring restitution any amount of effort and any amount of money over any length of time would not be enough anyway uh then slavery ends thanks lincoln uh and then we go down there and we decide that we're going to we're going to engage in reconstruction we're going to fuck up the south you know all these crazy fucking confederate leaders who loved raping black people so much they uh they uh they were literally willing to break from the union over it uh we're going to kill them we're go sherman is going to go down there sherman is just going to l just sort of just do a red line on the map and just sort of swoop through uh just just leave his mark you know and then we're going to go down there afterwards we're going to find everyone who gave a slip and we're going to hang them publicly and then uh, Abe Lincoln got assassinated shortly after the Civil War ended, and his coward, pussy, bitch-faced, fucking reformist, Confederate sympathizing vice president, uh, you know, uh, cut Reconstruction so uh, short. You know, along with a few other things. Uh, it's, it was it was bad. Lincoln should have lived. We would live in a better America today. He he had correspondence with Marx. Why was he assassinated again? I don't remember. It's a whole thing. Reconstruction never got to be finished. Not good. Not good. And as a product of that, all the people who were running around raping and murdering and enslaving black people and then going to war with the North over it got to live. They got to live and they got to uh, stay in positions of power. There were plenty of positions of local and state authority. You know, I, want, I want you to imagine being a recently freed black former slave in a county where the population is 80% black, uh, but the sheriff the constable and shit are all white. What do you think you're going to do? Do you think you have legal rights? Like, really think about it for a second. Like, this guy, the people who are in charge of the legal system are the same people who were, like, casually raping and murdering you yesterday. Do you think you have legal rights? No, you don't. No, you don't. Begin the Jim Crow era. Now, obviously, as time went on, you know, uh, material conditions developed substantially, uh, but the gap between black and white people was never fixed. The average IQ and level of educational attainment of American people rose in aggregate, including black people. Uh, a lot of this was motivated by factors like rampant industrialization, such as factories opening up in the North. Read this later, you keep messing up the history. Why not just say it? Why not just tell me? Range written. I'm not reading this. Just say it. Mods ban them forever, permanently. Like a ban for sharing the link? Yes. Uh, anyway. Uh, the, um... What was I saying? Yep, lost my train of thought. It's that easy. Am I, am I correct in saying that if Lincoln hadn't been assassinated, Reconstruction would have gone through better? Am I correct in that? Then that's all that I need to be right about, because I'm talking about race. I'm not a fucking historian. Jesus Christ. Um, I noticed when you drew the red line for where Sherman went burning, uh, you drew it way too far to the west. He never went in. I know! We're talking about race! Anyway, Jim Crow era, material conditions, factories opened up in the north. Uh, America became an industrial powerhouse. At the beginning of the 20th century, we were not an industrial powerhouse. Nobody really considered the United States a world power. I think until after World War I, and it was cemented after World War II. We really kicked up the industrialization into high gear for the war effort, and in doing so, you need a lot of people working in the factories, right? Now, here's the problem. How the fuck, especially in World War II, do you get people working in the factories when all the men are over here dying in Normandy? Well, you get the undesirables, by which I mean women and black people. Uh, and some other groups, but you know, in large part, these groups. This was a uh, last hired, first fired situation where a lot of these people were brought in for emergency labor replacement and were fired as soon as the white people got back from the war, you know? Um, so towards the end of World War II, you're in a very interesting position here where you have, especially in a lot of like larger East Coast American cities, you know, you have tenements uh, that are occupied by ethnic minority groups and black people uh, because they're the ones filling up the factories with these terrible, terrible jobs. And you've got a bunch of non-factory worker black people you know, all over America, but largely in the South, uh, sharecropping and sort of living in the areas where their ancestors were enslaved. 
you know, uh, whatever floats your boat, free country. Not really. It wasn't a free country then. It's still not really one now. Great stuff. Uh, it's, um, God. Um, oh, Magitech, you're getting banned too. Do, 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 do. You people have no self-control. None whatsoever. Absolutely none. Now, here we go, okay? World War II ends. Thankfully. And what happens after World War II? We paying attention? What happens after World War II? Well, the GI Bill gets put into action. All these white soldiers come back home, and they get to have their white picket fence suburban American dream bullshit. You know who didn't get it? Black soldiers. The black soldiers who fought didn't get that, and thus another uh, incredibly powerful road towards generational wealth was denied black people in this country. Um, this is something, by the way, that other ethnically marginalized groups could benefit from. The Irish and the Italians who served in the war, they could benefit from that, just not black people. So, you know, avenues for wealth acquisition that were available to other marginalized groups were specifically kept from black people. There's a reason for this, okay? For the past, I want to say, 400 years, white people have been really nervous about black people, okay? Um, we're nervous that one day we're going to get what's due. Now, I don't literally believe that uh, any white person should be harmed because their ancestors did bad stuff to black people's ancestors. However, in the grand scale of human civilizational development, it is not unheard of, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, sometimes when, when given the opportunity, historically aggrieved groups um, act out their frustrations. Will this happen in America with black people? It won't. Black people are a fundamental part of American cultural development. We're never going to have that kind of... We're, black people are never going to rise up and try to destroy whitey or whatever. It ain't happening. It's not happening. It is a, a fear of reprisal, a common white supremacist narrative. You have to keep your boot down because if you give them a, a little bit of leeway, they rise up. This is why a lot of white supremacists like to talk about South Africa and Rhodesia and shit, you know? Like... Oh, you give the blacks a little bit of leeway, and whoop, all of a sudden, you can't even keep them as slaves anymore. You know? Oh, you, you, you let them have a little freedom, and then those greedy black people try to fight for a regular amount of freedom, rather than just one-tenth of the amount of freedom that we gave them. I know, it's sad. So back we go. You know, the American uh, sort of establishment has always been kind of um, wary of black development. And I think that's one of the big reasons why they were kept out of the GI Bill. A lot of it was also to avoid angering white supremacist Americans, or also known as white Americans at the time, uh, who really don't like it when black people get roofs over their heads. It's a whole thing. They're just very vindictive. They're very emotional, these racists. Okay. So why have I gone through all of this? Well, what I'm establishing right now are the material conditions that lead to a set of economic realities. Where are black people in the United States? What are they doing? And what's about to happen? Well, a lot of parts of the United States right now, you know, uh, at this point are caught in a kind of economic transitory period, uh, namely between agrarian, uh, you know, sharecropping, sort of rural semi-industrial statewide development and like full-on everyone live in the cities everyone live in the pod everyone work in the factory like industrial revolution bullshit right and what this leads to is very densely packed cities that are highly diverse to capitalize in the largest possible labor pool high labor pool means lower wages of course at least uh, it, it, that's what it means if you let capitalism happen if you deign to let capitalists uh you know control the uh, the flow of economic forces, then you know you can have high labor as a as a way of um, lowering the, um, the the value of that labor, and you've got all these cities with high ethnic populations, minorities, black people, blah blah blah, and then what happens? Quick succession, folks. You got it. Death of manufacturing, drug war, bam 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 bam, a blam. These inner city areas that were vibrant hubs of industrial activity. Uh, experienced a phenomena called white flight. Uh, see, when the GI Bill got passed, 
after World War II, you know, all these white families, they're not going to live in the inner city anymore. They're going to go and live away from black people in the suburbs that were built for the white people. So white families and therefore a lot of wealth that they carry, because remember, it's Jim Crow. Black people don't have equal economic attainment. If white people leave a family, they're bringing a lot of that city's, or uh, leave a city, they're bringing a lot of that city's wealth with them. Leaving uh, disproportionately black and disproportionately poor communities at the base of these cities. And then you have the death of manufacturing. That is to say, uh, you know, the Rust Belt, we no longer, you know, we no longer um, uh, produce the vast stores of American wealth. Uh, by building cars in big factories right up next to a river. And point two, the drug war. Uh, the drug war was a plot by the Nixon administration to persecute anti-war protesters and people of color by associating them with different drugs. We all know about the 1980s CIA uh, crack cocaine, whatever. But even if you go back to Nixon, you can't make illegal being black, but you can make illegal having a good time. So, drug war and <laughs> death of manufacturing and white flight. What does that do to a city? Guys, you've got a bunch of black people in a city. They have no opportunities for economic attainment in their area. They have basically no opportunities to leave elsewhere due to redlining, uh, historical uh, and uh, contemporary. Um, they don't have the money to like make like big crazy decisions about where they're going to live, at least not on average. And the jobs in their place are driving up because businesses are are leaving because there's no money to sustain them. What happens? What do people do to make money? You still need food, water, rent, housing taxes, medical care, gasoline for driving your car. That's right. You turn to crime. You do the exact same thing that the Italians and the Irish did back in the 1920s. If you wonder why there were so many criminal elements to the Irish and Italian ethnic groups back in the 1920s, the answer is simple. We didn't give them other ways of surviving. It is that simple. It's not any more complicated than that. Black people in certain parts of America have been given through historical social forces, family to family, generation to generation, uh, neighborhoods which are not conducive towards economic attainment. And in those environments, they often turn to uh, drugs as a mechanism for making money. And if you are peddling drugs, you need a gang because you can't go to the police if you are wrong. Do you need an external system of protection uh, and uh, enforcement? So the gang uh, serves that purpose. And of course, in the absence of responsible policing and uh, police integration that's sort of community oriented. Many of these gangs act as a kind of de facto community police, sometimes to the benefit of the neighborhood, but often not. Because as it turns out, in a material sense, uh, community defense is not best enacted by a bunch of criminal drug runners uh, who have highly antagonistic attitudes towards, um, you know, the rundown uh, neighborhoods they live in. Uh, that just tends not to be like the bedrock of effective community defense. That is what produces disproportionate black crime. It's not all black people. It's inner cities and overwhelmingly gang or gang adjacent violence. It's that simple. Really, it is. Most crime, especially violent crime, is caused by proximity to economic inequality. Poor neighborhoods on their own, not too much crime. Wealthy neighborhoods, not too much. But the boundaries between wealth and poverty take skid row in Los Angeles. Where is Skid Row? Right off of Union Station. Historically, one of the biggest transportation and trade hubs in the city. A lot of wealth runs through there. Two blocks away, you've got people dying in the streets. It is the adjacency. It's areas carved out by wealth and left to rot. It's areas that don't have the civic uh, communal culture to care for one another because of mutual distrust and predatory behavior on the part of the police and the gangs that look to replace them. It's that simple. It happened with other ethnic groups. Everything people say, 1350, 1350, 1350, and then they celebrate that fascist bitch who just went up in Italy. The Italians were the 1350 a hundred years ago. They were the 1350. 
Before all the factors that I'm talking about, black people weren't all in it. 1920s America didn't have black people doing a ton of crime in the inner city. That, that was the fucking Italians. They were the 1350. And what happened? Well, eventually they were able to benefit from systems of economic attainment that weren't available to non-white people. And then they evened out. Do you understand how when people say 1350, they betray their ignorance on the subject? This is an empirically falsifiable talking point. If you genuinely believe that disproportionate rates of crime being committed by African Americans is evidence of some kind of innate biological problem, then be reminded of this. The material role that black people fill in the United States, the underclass, is one that this country has always had and will have even if you somehow got rid of all the black people. Leaving aside the fact that the mass exodus or murder of all black Americans would cause more suffering, strife, and crime than a millennia of any projected crime rates from that population, more than a millennia, leaving aside that fact, you know who else? It'd just be the Italians again, or it'd be the Irish, or something. It'd be something. Because it's caused by material conditions. It is that simple. America has a lot of crime. We have a lot of income inequality. There are other countries with less crime and less income inequality. They tend to go along. They tend to work in tandem. It is causative. Those are the two primary arguments that I hear from racists for racism. The idea that it brings down your civilization, it doesn't. And by the way, let's not even talk about how much cultural hegemony America has enjoyed as a product of the culinary and musical contributions of African Americans, you know? Seethe and cope and cry about it. Back in the 1920s, white supremacists were shitting themselves in fear of their white daughters going to Harlem and dancing a jig while listening to a black guy with a trombone. Uh, but you know what? Black guys with trombones are more powerful than you, white boy. Uh, and so the trombone and the black man persisted. Jazz, blues, swing, rock and roll, R&B, hip hop, rap, don't know what it is. If you wanted to make any case for biological essentialism, you should ask why black people are better at making music than white people. I'm only half joking, seriously. It's like all American musical history. The two big ones are that it'll destroy civilization and also that racism is valid because the differences in crime, you know, between different populations, yeah, it's like, oh, well, they must be better or worse or whatever. I've already talked about the IQ thing, but to further elaborate on it very briefly, uh, it is impossible to determine whether or not there is any inherent genetic cause of racial IQ differences. Uh, very often we have been able to control four population IQ differences through environmental forces. There were British eugenicists who wrote on the retard level IQs of the Irish people back in the 1940s and 30s and such. And nowadays the Irish and the British have like the same IQ. That's because back then the Irish were not treated as good as today. And now that they are doing a bit better, they read books more. IQ doesn't actually measure general intelligence, of course. If it did, then education would have no bearing on your IQ score. And it obviously does. So we're talking about a, you know, a variable here that is uh, very, very, very culturally controlled. Same with the Koreans and Japanese. Exactly the same. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, the IQ... Oh yeah, here. In 1850, the Irish were 220% overrepresented in arrests and 550% overrepresented in convictions in New York City. IQ don't mean nothing. It does determine stuff. Chiefly, IQ tests determine your IQ. What it doesn't determine is your general intelligence, which is what the IQ test, uh, you know, people say it's supposed to do. Uh, your general intelligence, your just genetic predisposition towards problem solving is not something we have any ability to test for. We can approximate that test by testing general stuff in the area, uh, and those results can be informative. A person with an IQ of 150 probably does have some genetic intellectual advantages over a person with an IQ of 80 or 70. Uh, Probably, uh, it seems likely at least. Um, but for population analysis, it has proven a, um, let's say at most a self-referential uh, study. You know, well, what does the IQ difference say? Well, it says that there's an IQ difference between these two populations. That's what it says, you know. 
the I, the I, we we have we have you know methodically tested these populations and determined that uh, through IQ tests that the IQ scores in these countries are different, meaning that if they took IQ tests, they would get different scores. It's fairly self-contained there, you know. I'll quit hampering on. Um, there are tons of arguments against many historical conceptions of a purely genetic or even partially genetic explanation for uh, uh, IQ differences, but I'm just going to say it real simple. Uh, this is a highly researched subject, and it's been researched for hundreds of years. How many studies have determined a causative uh, racial genetic aggregate factor when it comes to general intelligence? How many? Can you guess the number? It's a small number. The answer is zero. It is zero. It's not actually an answerable question, of course. Um, is it possible that there are incredibly minute differences in average general intelligence between humans that can be ascribed to racial categories? It's obviously not impossible, uh, you know, because uh, we don't know. Uh, it doesn't seem likely based on my understanding of the research, in large part because intelligence is determined by a really complicated multivariate composition of genetic, uh, you know, expression. Uh, as opposed to stuff like skin color or nose shape or whatever, which can be determined by a much smaller number of genes. To put it another way, what made human brains special? We are special. We're different from the other animals. What made it that way? Uh, a lot of stuff, actually, but here's a couple of things, okay? Uh, we use tools, language systems, social, uh, 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 social engagement, um, and we're all autistic as a species, right? Shit like that, you know, stuff like that, right? You might notice every attribute that you can find is equally applicable in people, uh, you know, uh, uh, over here as people over here. Problem solving? Uh, yeah, yeah, tribes up here need more of it than here, so they would evolve better brains. What? What? Huh? Social attainment. Um... People up here socialized more than people down here, so they would develop better brains to- What? Uh, people up here had to plan for the winter, which requires brain matter, as opposed to people here who- What? What? Arid conditions don't require planning? You've seen Dune? <laughs> what? Um, yeah. It's very stupid. Brains? Very complicated. Took a long time for them to get this fancy, okay? Long time for them to get this fancy affected by an incredible range of genetic expression, most of the stuff, no, I'll say it, all of the stuff that made humans smart, all the things that our brains maximized for, are still maximized for in Africa, not just in the Nordic reaches. Uh, the idea that there's some kind of like brain evolutionary difference, it just doesn't make any sense. A basic understanding of genetic development makes that sound laughable. Um, so it's just, it's, it's just, yeah. It's, um, pretty dumb. Yeah. The brain in Hopo sapiens sapiens has been basically the same for the past 50 to 80,000 years. Yeah, the complexities of our brain development, uh, are significant, and the idea that... Okay, let me put it this way. You guys, you guys ever noticed how dumb jocks get lots of pussy? You ever noticed that? Trust me. The humans... Humans as a species do not aggressively select for, uh preferable values in the thousands of bits of genetic expression that make up our brain chemistry, okay? Uh, the only actually genetically selected for characteristic is dick size, um, in which case they always hop on the fat cocks, you know? That's the only thing they worry about. Um, outside of that, uh, you know, you don't, you don't need to concern yourself with the possible downstream effects of, you know, genetic selection, um, which is great, which is fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm being a little bit goofy here. I just want to, like, there is no scientific evidence to, to point to any of this, okay? It's like, it, people pull it out of their hats. Um, oh yeah, as a final one, uh, oftentimes white supremacists will prove that, or sorry, prove, I should have done the finger quotes, you know, they'll prove through very bad, um, anthropological evidence that, um, you know, uh, uh people here are like, evolutionarily super different from people here and there was like no connection for like a hundred thousand years or some shit this is not true depending on where exactly you are and it gets more difficult like the more isolated you are like if you're some like tiny philippine island maybe or something like that but i think um 
I think in terms of like human genetic diversity, there are common ancestors that can usually be traced back within a few tens of thousands of years. Considering how complicated our brain development is, tens of thousands of years of shared ancestry, we're like all the same. We're all the same. Everyone who says otherwise is cope. Uh, funnily enough, the only like empirically demonstrable evidence of, uh, of a low IQ brain is pointing at like basic phenotypical and circumstantial differences and like trying to ascribe it as some kind of fundamental taxonomical difference. That is unironically an indication of low intelligence, which is why racism correlates with low IQ. Speaking of consistently, people who are racist tend to be less educated and be less intelligent. They actually tend to be worse off in almost every imaginable metric uh, relative to their, um, you know, their, um, uh, their, their, their brain, you know, uh, being good. And that is because a lot of racism is exactly what I talked about at the beginning, all the way back in the beginning, when I talked about the original mistake. Uh, hold on. The original mistake that we made a long time ago, right here. This. The original sin. This brain is the part of the brain that is being used by people when they make that argument. The reason is because they are relying on lizard brain, uh, uh, evo psych tier, like biological tribalist instincts to inform their decision making. They have a pre existing bias, which is hundreds of years of cultural messaging on the differences between the races being informed by a, a minor set of selected differences that they're identifying skin color no shape hair type and then projecting an entirely falsifiable disproven arbitrary constantly sh goalpost shifting bullshit set of pseudoscientific standards in order to justify their real position, which is a political and downright, like, um, epistemic supremacy uh, for white people. Not all of them do it on purpose. There are a lot of people who say and believe racist stuff, who genuinely worry about stuff like multiculturalism collapsing America or black crime or whatever. I can't tell you how many of them are aware of the fact that they're operating out of a kind of, like, first principles preference for you know, one race over another, but I can tell you that they tend to operate under the same basic presumptions. So why is it morally wrong to be racist? Because it's morally wrong to be fucking retarded. That's the reason why. Uh, you're, you're, dis you're disgracing God. You're disgracing our, our species. You're, uh, you're, you're tearing us down as a people. Uh, you're a retard. Your brain is retarded. Um, and that's morally wrong. That's not good. It's literally like, uh, dark skin color must correlate with inferior internal parts. You're judging the contents of a computer based on its case color. You are retarded. Your brain hurts, and you should stop. That's why it's morally wrong. There we go. I thought it had been a while since we did a, we did a lecture-style video. I actually got a random email recently which said something like, you've done a lot of videos on X and Y lately, but it's been a while since you've done a good old why racism is bad video. You shouldn't be presumptive and assume that everyone's always going to agree with you on that because you've got older videos that directly address it. Um, and at first I thought that was an annoying email, but then I think I agree with it. So I decided that I was going to do multiple videos. This is the first one in a series. I'm going to do this on all of the major bigotries. I'm going to do this on sexism, homophobia, uh, transphobia, um, probably xenophobia, sort of like the conceptual fear of the other, like as determined by uh, by 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 borders or boundaries. Uh, ableism, yeah, yeah, ableism for sure. Uh, yeah, I'll try. Yeah, I'll try to fit. It. Yeah, I'll try to. Um, and by the way, the ableism one is going to end with me calling people who disagree with me retarded. So you're in for a bit of a whiplash on that. You know, you're going to have like this protracted explanation on like uh, you know human like uh variance and in, in performance then at the end it'll be like you know well don't do this because it'll make you retarded end video how about anti-semitism I, I think that'd be a good one yeah islamophobia and anti-semitism would be good ones i could do the anti-semitism one without prior research i would need to do research for the islamophobia one though i feel like i'm not as i, I would need to be a bit more up on that but i could do it yeah 